Hey, Hawkeye fans, Chad Leistico of the Des Moines Register. Uh, yeah, we would have loved to have done an instant reaction podcast last night, but it was getting pretty late. And uh, we wanted to do a live one this morning for you guys uh, after Iowa's 91 to 89 victory against the Indiana Hoosiers. Uh, a wild, wild one that uh, I was at home for that. Uh, Kennington was in the arena, so I'm going to lean on his expertise on some of the uh, combustible moments of the game and maybe even some of the post game stuff. But uh, Kennington, let's start off just with uh, let's set the scene uh, where you are now before we get started, before we wind up, because I uh, imagine my surprise when I woke up this morning to find out you're already on your way to Rutgers for a game that doesn't start for 50 hours. So how are you doing? Like you're, you must have not got much sleep last night. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I did not get much sleep at all, <laughs> but uh, I'm at O'Hare Airport in Chicago, so I don't know. Usually we, we fly in a day before. I don't know what I was thinking when I was booking the, the travel. I guess I thought the game was on Saturday. I don't know what I was thinking, but uh, I am flying out uh, a little bit early, but I did have enough time during my layover to catch this podcast with you, which I'm thankful for because we set this up um, prior to me knowing when I was flying out. So I'm glad it worked out. Um, yeah, not much sleep last night, but the game more than made up for it. I mean, it was really exciting and a really crazy atmosphere, honestly. Everything leading up to the game was so much not about the game, and rightfully so, because you know, Patrick McCaffrey and his decision to leave the team for anxiety reasons was rightfully the, the proper storyline, and I'm glad that it got the attention that it deserved. But on the back burner of that was an absolute must-win game against a top-15 opponent, and Iowa was on a skid. And for the first few minutes, it looked like, um, you know, a potential season ending loss because they turned it around. And all of a sudden, you know, kind of a crazy, the difference a few days makes. It kind of feels like Iowa is in a position to somewhat get their season back on track with um, a few more key games coming up. Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, it, uh, you know, uh, like I said, I was watching from home and it's like 23 to four. <laughs> like. Uh, I had told uh, our bosses, like, yeah, all right, you know, if it's an instant classic. It had been a pretty busy week, as you, as you know. Um, and uh, I had I was working on some other stuff on Thursday. But uh, as the game went on, I was like, oh, gosh, it is, it is going to be an instant classic maybe. And uh, uh, so let's start. Uh, I don't even know where to start, honestly. So let's just start with uh, the coaches. <laughs> Fran McCaffrey gets a technical foul where he uh, basically storms onto the court uh, right in the face of Court, Courtney Green in the middle of the game, gets one technical foul. The score ended up being 30 to 13 after that. Uh, he had been, I rewatched the game this morning actually. He had been fuming at his own players in a timeout just before that. I believe he was mad with Chris Murray because he wasn't at the top of the press. I could be misreading because I wasn't there, but I think that's what happened. But of course, Chris isn't used to being at the top of the press. It's usually Patrick. So, anyway. So Fran was already hot under the collar. Then that happened. Uh, then you'd have to say it worked because Iowa, after getting down 35 to 15, all of a sudden goes on a, a tremendous run. Connor McCaffrey hit a, a huge long three to kind of just start everything. And I think when uh, it was on 11 0 spurt and Chris Murray hits a three at the top of the key and like, like that it's 35, 26. And then it's like a game again, you're kind of back in it. Um, the chip away, chip away. And then uh, obviously we'll get to the thing at the end, but uh, what did you make just Kennington of just sort of uh, the climb back uh, that Iowa had to make? And they pressed the whole time, didn't sub hardly at all. Uh, it was really uh, quite the uh, gutty effort. I think that was the word Chris Murray used. And, uh, you know, how was the crowd too? Because uh, it seemed the announcers on TV, Raftery and Benetti were very impressed with the loudness of the crowd on the 40th anniversary of Carver Hawkeye Arena, 40th birthday. Yeah, so just to start about Fran, I mean, like you said, he was he was pretty upset throughout the opening minutes, I think. In addition to what you pointed out, you could point to Iowa's lack of defensive intensity to start the game. Ray Thompson and Trace Jackson Davis were dominating the paint inside. There was a, a bit of softness in Iowa's front court and the way that they were playing. A lot of Indiana's points came, you know, right in the paint, right in the in the middle of, of their defense to start. And I think that that kind of got Fran a, a little heated. And it's interesting that you bring up, you know, the technical foul and kind of the run that sparked it. Peyton Sanford, who was a huge part of last night's win, 
was one of the players in the huddle that was very vocal when the team called those early timeouts when they were down, you know, 19, 20, 21 points. And I don't know if they were showing on the TV, but when Fran got the technical, Creighton was, you know, the first player to kind of walk up to him, put his arm around him and say, we're good. I could, you know, read his mouth, he said, we're good. He goes to the team and he said, we're good, we're fine. And then, like you said, the run kind of sparked from there. So Philip Obacha pointed to Peyton as kind of a, of a leader during that moment. And that was something that, that I noticed that I, I can add on to what you, you said. But as far as the run, Philip and Chris both had, and Fran for that matter, all had very interesting tidbits about the comeback. So Philip said that when they were down, you know, 21 points early, it was a very much a gut check moment for the team. He said that they had lost three games in a row. It was kind of the same story over and over again. Bad starts in the first half, too big of a hole to climb out of, and they just decided collectively that enough was enough. And he said that they were in the huddle, and they were looking at each other, and everybody kind of took accountability for their part in the, the skid and said, okay, what can we do in order to climb our way back? Which brings me to what Chris Murray said. And he said that it was about uh, four by four by four by four, which he meant was winning four-minute segments at a time. Iowa obviously lost the first four-minute segment they were down by you know 21 points and then as you said they just slowly climbed their way back and you know the way they did it was just by by not rushing france said that a lot of times teams get into these situations and you'll see them quick shoot the ball you'll see them get out of their offense because they're trying to make up the entire deficit in one possession you obviously can't do that but it's easier said than done as we've seen in, in college basketball so they just kind of crept their way back and, and kind of pinning it all together with the crowd. I mean, the crowd was great. In the opening minutes, it was a very um, somber crowd, I would say. I mean, it was it was a certain buzz in the arena when they were down that many points, and the buzz was, as you can expect, like, well, this this might be it for, for Iowa season. And then it just kind of took them, once they got back to about that 12-point deficit, and then once it got down to nine points, I mean, the place was roaring. I mean, the fans were on their feet. And it wasn't a sellout, but it felt – like a sellout. There was um, a certain electricity from that point on through the rest of the game. And, you know, the fans were just hungry for Iowa to make a play to get the fans, you know, get them back into it. And once the crowd got into it, they definitely affected the, the game. And Indiana had 11 first half turnovers. So the crowd definitely played a huge factor in that Iowa was able to kind of turn their defense into some offense into the first half and, and cut it down to 10 at halftime. And then, you know, they were pretty much um, rolling, quote unquote, from, from there. I know it was a close game, but from down 21, to down to a half time to eventually taking the lead in, the, in the, the midway part of the second half. It was a it was a pretty crazy comeback. So there was a lot of moving parts and a, and a lot of elements that went into the comeback, but a lot of it just kind of came down to Iowa's players, um, you know, just kind of looking themselves in the eyes and in the mirror metaphorically and saying that, um, you know, we want to salvage this season. It has to start right here. Well, uh, we could we could talk about a lot of players. Obviously, Chris Murray deserves probably his own podcast. Um, he has uh, Chris Murray is averaging twenty one point five points per game in the second half alone. The last two games against Penn State and Indiana had twenty two at Penn State, as I almost brought Iowa all the way back, and then he had twenty one last night, uh, scoring thirty and ten against the Hoosiers. I'm sure the Hoosiers are sick of facing a Murray <laughs> after. What uh, Chris did to him last year, 29 at home, then Keegan in the Big Ten uh, semifinals uh, last year with the 34 points and eight three-pointers. Uh, and then, of course, Chris uh, just goes goes nuts last night and uh, was probably the best player on the court. Uh, but uh, beyond Chris, uh, well, actually, let's, let's stick with Chris for a sec because he, like I said, he plays 40 minutes at Penn State. Talked to him on Wednesday, and he's like, yeah, a lot of time in the training room, but I didn't really get that tired. So uh, I think he's going to have a lot more time in the training room uh, between now and their flight to Rutgers. Uh, you know, he was at the top of the press, so he was pressing on defense all night. And then, uh, as I wrote, uh, no bigger play in the game uh, of all the points and all the rebounds and, and all the heroics, uh, the block shot with 13 seconds left uh, as Iowa leads. 87-86, a totally botched possession after two timeouts before that. Iowa really, it almost looked like Iowa was going to lose another one of those close games because they already lost in overtime to Wisconsin at home. The Penn State game, you know, they got so close and kind of had a shot at the end but didn't win. And then uh, and then they, they get to the 13-second mark, and Chris Murray at the block 
not only blocks the shot, but gets the rebound, gets fouled, makes two free throws, and that essentially sealed it for the Hawkeyes. What you? What? Uh, how about Chris Murray? He to me, he is. He looks like Keegan out there, and I know we're not supposed to compare the two, but man, uh, in a little different way, but just in terms of taking over a game and and just being so good everywhere on the court. Yeah, I mean, just to start with the 40 minute thing, Chris was asked about that in the post game, and his ample his answer was simple yet profound at the same time. He just said, you know, it's tough to play 40 minutes, but my team needed me. And they needed every single second of what Chris put on the court last night to end the, to to win the game. I think that we didn't talk about this. Um, I know I was off, but I think, you know, speaking for you and myself, I think the feeling was going into this game that Chris had to play 40 minutes and not only play 40 minutes, had to be spectacular in that 40 minutes to give Iowa a chance. And this was a game worthy of the national spotlight and for him to be named to the Naismith player of the year midseason list earlier this week and then put out you know these big performances like this and what this game meant for Iowa season for him to have the performance that he did you know solidifies who he is nationally as a player that's kind of what what I look at this game as is just you know continued validation that Chris is uh, a number one player and how much trust Iowa has in him. I think that if you're looking at it from a, a holistic standpoint, and I think Keegan kind of got somewhat of this criticism last year, is that you would just like to see that aggression just right out of the gate. You know, you just like to see Chris come out, dominate, get into the flow of the game early um, and kind of establish himself. It hasn't quite been like that, but once he gets into a rhythm and once he you know, finds his comfort zone. I mean, he's almost unstoppable out there. So nine points in the first half. He was active in the first half. He had nine shots in the first half. It wasn't like he was, um, you know, completely invisible, but he came out in the second half very comfortable and, um, you know, really led, led Iowa. And it, it doesn't help, I mean, it doesn't hurt, excuse me, that, you know, other players in the front court really um, helps him out as well. So they're getting it off into him. They know he's a focal point of the offense. And um, it was a, it was a two-way effort for Chris. And, um, again, he's like, you know, the Indiana killer. Almost a year to the day. I think it was January 13th last year, 29 of 11. And then checks the day, January 5th, you know, 30 and 10 in a, in a comeback win. So um, Chris could play Indiana every night. <laughs> we could be talking about, a, you know, an all-time uh, great here. Yeah. Uh, definitely a – uh, uh, an interesting rematch now is set up for February 28th in Bloomington. Uh, that is going to be a lot of fun. A lot of people are already talking about that because it seemed like there was a lot of animosity uh, during the game and after the game. Uh, you'll remember this, Kennington, at the Big Ten tournament last year. It was late in the game. I remember the, where Fran walked over to the middle of the Indiana huddle <laughs> in the Big Ten tournament semifinals because uh, I, I don't even – now I'm just blanking why, but it was late in the game. And he was like, just, <laughs> he was like in their huddle, in their face, did not get a T for it. It was late in the game. They, and then he did the same thing last night, late in the game. Uh, and uh, Mike Woodson had, had some choice words about that. I've got it called up. We'll see if it can, uh, can uh, come through the YouTube pod. Give me a nod if it does. Uh, I'm going to try. Uh, here we go. I'm not, I'm not even going to comment on that because that's, that's bullshit. That's what it is. You know, you can, you can print that. Because. It's kind of, it kind of went out a bit. Yeah. <laughs> That he's a, he's like a no com no comment and you can print that uh, he was all over the place uh, Mike Woodson but anyway so on TV a lot of us I, me included I thought he was giving a technical to the Indiana assistant coach Paul Zelk did signal T and then he was like all of a sudden huddle up huddle up huddle up so uh, I don't did you have a sense for who uh, they were initially calling the technical on Kennington uh, any any word on that after the game. It felt like it was on Fran from where I was sitting, at least, just because, you know, I know that 
you know, Iowa fans are getting on Mike Woodson and being like, oh, well, don't blow a 21 point lead. But I'm going to be honest, Mike Woodson does have a point. Like, if, if a coach does cross over, you know, half court, especially getting as close as, as Fran was, you would expect nine times out of 10 for that to be a tech mentor. I thought it was a tech on Fran just because the when the referee called the tech from my vantage point, it wasn't, he didn't like point specifically to say who it was on. When I saw the replay, the ref calls the technical and doesn't even look in Iowa's direction after he calls it. So if you look at it from the back view, he calls the tech and immediately turns to Indiana. So if you look at it from that angle, it's obviously on Indiana's side. Um, but it's like you don't get that in a real-time view from where we sit in press row. So, um, you know, it wasn't on France, so that was inaccurate by by Wilson. But uh, I do kind of feel him, though. Like, if, uh, you know, you see a team, a coach charging over, and then Connor got even further along than, than, than Fran did. And he was fired up as well, and it took a collective effort to kind of reel him back in. But like you said, it was a, it was a chippy game. And I understand, you know, first why the ref called the technical and then, you know, he kind of pulled it back and it was kind of like a, a play on. I mean, it was a it was an emotional, it was a chippy game. I mean, there could have been many technicals or, or all that throughout the, the course of the game. So it was just highly competitive. Um, you know, the refs, there were some questionable calls throughout throughout the game on both sides. But, you know, they were doing the best that they could, I guess, to um, keep everything um kosher i guess i should say but definitely circle february uh i believe it's february 28th um in bloomington because that's gonna be um that's going to be highly interesting you know these teams like you said they have there's a lot of um bad blood you know last year the the chris um chris murray game that was a highly tested game like you said they saw each other in the big 10 tournament and that was an instant classic and then tonight um, so those things kind of compound on top of each other. And, uh, and then it's the big 10. I mean, everybody, you could kind of make a case as like a rival in some way. So there was a lot going on uh, on both sides, really physical game. Chris Murray talked about it. Philip Roger talked about it, but for an Iowa team where people kind of question their toughness a bit during this, this skid to see them battle through that physicality, battle through that adversity and come out with the win is, is a really good sign for the trajectory of their season. Yeah, our plan on this podcast was to talk about 20 minutes of hoops and 10 of football. Uh, we will uh, we might spill over a little bit with hoops, but uh, let's just touch on a few more things off Iowa, Indiana, because there's just so much to unpack with this game. And uh, let's talk about Peyton Sanford and Josh Dix, even. Uh, I think two good stories that emerged from this game. Uh, Sanford, uh, uh, boy, the, the, the person in my text group who gave me the long message about how Sanford doesn't even belong on the court and <laughs> uh, uh, speculating about, uh, uh, you know, that he shouldn't even play at all. But he came to play right away. It was 28 or no, 23 to four, uh, Indiana and, and Sanford uh, uncorks his first shot. He had been 0 of 19 in Big Ten play uh, until that shot. So he makes the shot. Has a really solid game. I didn't think he tried to do too much. I thought he was just able to do a lot of different things. Ends up with 11 points, four boards. Hits two clutch free throws at the end. As you said, emotional leader. Had a big tip in in the second half. Uh, really, he found Murray on a backdoor cut. He really kind of took the Patrick McCaffrey role. He played 25 minutes. And then the stat, I, I subscribe to the plus minus stat, not like religiously, but like I look at it and I consider it uh, pretty – uh validating and uh he was plus 24 he was <laughs> plus 24 in his 25 minutes i mean chris murray by comparison was plus two you know for as good as he was philip robracha plus three um so when peyton was on the court he made a positive impact and then uh, lastly josh dix i mean he plays nine nine almost ten minutes uh takes one shot hits a big three and was trusted with a lot of minutes down the stretch so i think you're seeing Fran's plan without Patrick is a lot more Sanford. And if you can play like that, that's awesome. And then, you know, a handful of dicks and he should be, you know, that almost adds up to the minutes uh, that Patrick was giving you and the rest of the guys got to play a lot. Yeah. Starting with Peyton, this was a talking point after the game as well. He knew that he was going to have a bigger role with Patrick out. And I think that's kind of the ironic part about it is for someone who is struggling so badly, they get an increase in responsibility 
uh, just because of, you know, the attrition on the team right now. And it is kind of a situation where usually a struggling player would sit, but Iowa is just too thin for that to, to be the case. I mean, he has to play. And in some ways, I think maybe this, this large role gave him, you know, a bit of a confidence boost. Like, okay, like, I haven't played well. Um, you know, throughout the season, it's been particularly bad in Big Ten play, but I have an opportunity in the biggest game of the year to kind of turn it around. And one thing about Peyton that I think people have grown to appreciate about him is that even when his shot is not falling, he usually tries to affect the game in other ways. And I know the last two games haven't been reflective of that. He's only played eight and nine minutes, so kind of hard for him to kind of get into a room. He just didn't have it and didn't play a lot. But to... Last night was a a great example of him uh, just affecting the game in all types of ways, like you said. He did get off to a 3 for 3 start. The rest of the way, he was only 1 for 6. But like you said, he was rebounding. He was finding uh, players in in the passing lane. He was doing what he could on the defensive end. So you just kind of saw him do a little bit of everything for for Iowa. With Josh Dix, the sequence that you're referencing where he – Hits the three pointer where they were they were down at that point. It was seventy two to seventy. They were down. He hits the three pointer. Next possession down on defense. He gets the defensive rebound. Um, finds Desante Bowen, who then finds Chris Murray, who gets the and one. They go up by four. That was one of the critical stretches in the game. So he didn't play a lot of he didn't play a whole lot of minutes. And stats won't blow you away, but you actually had to like watch him just kind of see the impact that he had. And um, another thing, we were talking about responsibility and trusting him in that big moment. What he was able to do defensively, helping Philip Robracha on the double teams in the post, closing out on three-pointers, um, he showed a lot of maturity for uh, a young guy in that moment. So we've been kind of waiting for him, DeSante Bowen, the freshman, to kind of grow up a bit. It's been happening on the fly. I think last night was definitely a big maturation moment for him. And you know, Fran, he's, he's one of those coaches that will say openly, if he feels like you deserve more minutes, he, you know, he said he's going to try to do that. He said he feels like Josh has played well enough recently to earn more minutes. So, you know, would expect his role to, you know, steadily increase as, as time goes on. Uh, and now the next test uh, at Rutgers, uh, 11 a.m. on Sunday. That's going to be insanely tough, uh, especially on the short turnaround after this emotional win. Rutgers is playing really well. Uh, as you remember, Kennington, they held Iowa to 46 points a year ago, just held Maryland to 50 last night. Also just beat number one Purdue the other night. So they're number 14 in the net, really good team. Iowa does move up to 60 in the net. So after the Eastern Illinois uh, collapse. And now when you look back on that, Kennington, we haven't had a chance to talk about this. Uh, you know, the Patrick McCaffrey impact. Uh, you know, check out my coverage at Hawk Central on that. But uh, you just look back now at those three games Eastern Illinois, Nebraska, Penn State, knowing what Patrick was going through. uh, Obviously, you know, Chris Murray and Connor McCaffrey did not play in that Eastern Illinois game either. So there really was nowhere to turn with him kind of running out of steam, dealing with what he was dealing with, peaking with anxiety, and it obviously affected the rest of the team. So uh, you kind of understand where they're coming from, and maybe if he does come back, this team can really be a lot stronger for it. Maybe it'll be too late. Uh, maybe he won't come back. We will see. We got to give Patrick his own timetable, obviously. But um, you know, it was kind of cool on the broadcast. Bill Raftery and, and Jason Manetti talked about it a lot, and uh, uh, Raftery was was really confident that Patrick would be fine. And that, knowing that he probably talked to Fran a lot before the game, I think I think there's a lot of confidence that uh, from Margaret and also from Fran that the positive outpouring of support that Patrick is receiving uh, is really going to help him. Uh, on his way back. And then when he comes back, I feel like he maybe he will feel more support, I'm guessing, um, from the crowd, from the fans, from every from people. You know, instead of looking at him as the coach's son, they're going to look at him as a person. And I feel like that's a really emotional transition, Kennington, that needed to happen almost for uh, a lot of people. Uh, not pointing fingers at you know anybody in particular or anything, but I'm just saying like, this is a this is a young man with feelings, a young man that wants to give everything he can to the program for his family. Uh, he's a great guy, and uh, I think he, and he's got a great game. He, he's a great player, and I think he doesn't get enough respect for the player that he is. So uh, when he does come back, I, I think he's going to come back. I think this is going to be a good thing. And kudos again to Patrick for for doing what he's doing, uh, sitting out. 
Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, him finding you know peace where he's at is obviously the number one priority. And he's talked a lot, like you said. There were there's inherent there's pressure on him, even if you take away the fact that he is you know Fred McCaffrey's son. He was a top one hundred player. He is a starter on a power five team playing in arguably the best conference in America. And then you add on the pressures of being the son of the head coach. And he's talked about it before, and he understands that that is what comes with it, but that doesn't make it easy to deal with. So he has a lot going on in his personal life outside of basketball that we don't know about. Obviously, there's a lot going on basketball-wise, and all of that stuff just kind of weighs on him. And I think at the also, let's note that he is um, – you know, still a young man at the end of the day, you know, in his early 20s dealing with, with a lot. So, you know, we're going to continue to to pray for him and, and hope that he's progressing daily. I think it is a good thing that he is still with the team and it's going to be, you know, around for the daily activities just so, you know, so he can still feel engaged. And I think that everybody, um, you know, treating him normally is, is also going to be a good thing just to provide a sense of normalcy for him. So when he steps back in, whenever that time, you know, is, like you said, I expect for it to, to be pretty seamless. And, um, you know, we're all looking forward to Patrick kind of getting back to that joyful person that, that he is. Because, like you said, he truly is um, a pleasure to be around. And prior to this recent skid, I mean, he was playing really well. Go back and look at his offensive numbers and the points that he was putting up. I mean, he was, you know, really emerging as a, as a really good secondary scorer to, to Chris Murray. So, you know, hoping that that he gets back on the court, you know, whenever he's ready and when he does that, you know, he'll continue to the progress that he had early in the season. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, are you good uh, to talk a little football? I don't know what your time frame is for your next flight. Yeah, I'm good. We can, okay. We can go. yeah. Hopefully your Chili's order is in. And <laughs> um, we uh, – let's talk – I don't know where to begin. I guess on the radio show this week with Andrew Downs, we talked a lot about – at least enough about the Tory Taylor coming back, Lucas Van Ness leaving. So we don't have to get into that. Joe Evans comes back. So there's some other news kind of late in the week we haven't talked about in the podcasts. Uh, Joe Evans coming back. Uh, that was expected. That was in my roster projection. But it's a big deal. Uh, it kind of replaces Lucas Van Ness. So that's big. And then uh, Iowa, you know, adds a quarterback in Deacon Hill from Wisconsin. Does that, uh, you know, that really gives me a sense that John Budmeyer is going to be a factor, a part of this coaching staff going forward. Uh, the fact that he recruited Cade, and Mac, Cade McNamara initially and uh, clearly had something to do with him coming here through the portal. And now they add basically quarterback depth to compete uh, this spring. It gives Joe Labus someone to compete against for that number two job, right? And, uh, you know, Cade McNamara is going to be QB1. Uh, I think he's probably going to be okay for spring to, to participate. Maybe not right away, but at least at some point. So uh, at least it gives you more arms too, uh, so you can run practice, all that stuff. But uh, you know, he came; he was a four-star prospect by rivals, and uh, you know, he's a young guy. He's got a lot of eligibility left, I believe. Uh, uh, three years left of eligibility, or four years, three years, three years. So uh, you know, it's an interesting ad. You said he was a walk-on, I guess. Uh, I didn't realize that initially, but uh, it makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah, I love the move personally. Like you said, this isn't just a guy. I mean, this was somebody who was highly ranked. He is from a physical standpoint. He he looks a far bigger quarterback. He doesn't have the same mobility as a K McNamara or a Joe Labus, but that's not a prerequisite to play in Iowa's offense as currently constructed. I expect him to come in to compete and that's what you need in, in Iowa's quarterback room right now. You just need competition, you need depth. And, you know, you need someone to, to come in and to push Joe as well for that number two spot. Michael Linus is going to come in the summertime. And it really is interesting how quickly and just like how different the quarterback room looks today versus how it looked at the beginning of, you know, the season. You still have, you know, the frontline starter in Cade. You have somebody who generated a little bit of excitement who's a younger guy and Joe Lavison shows some size and now you're bringing in Deacon Hill um, who's going to add an element to himself and then you know the future um, you know after Joe Lavis Marco Linus is coming in the, in the summer so um, got to give credit to the coaching staff again for how quickly they are moving at the earliest possible time that they could they went and got a starting quarterback out of the transfer portal in Cade Carson May leaves the program and the very next day 
you know, they replace him with another four-star quarterback. So you have to give Kirk and the, and the staff a little bit of credit here, you know. Um, backs have been, their backs have been against the wall a few times, like in this offseason of trying to bring in talent, and they're finding ways to respond. And I know people listening to this, you know, live and afterwards are going to say, well, what about the offensive line? Well, what about more receivers? They are trying. You know, it's going to take a little bit of time, but they are actively trying to, to add some more pieces. But, you know, for what they've done so far, um, considering all the circumstances, I feel like the coaches have done a good job, you know, replenishing the, the talent on the roster. And you know, the rest of January is going to be really interesting. Yeah, Iowa, uh, according to Blair Sanderson at Hawkeye Report, um, had a couple uh, or had a big visitor in town last night for the game. Um, Dejon Parker, who is committed to Virginia. Uh, grad transfer from Saginaw Valley State uh, played he's a left tackle right tackle uh, you know has some kind of medium-sized offers uh, in addition to Virginia and you know, it's like Washington State Tulane um, but he's 6 five 300 so he's an, he's a guy that's uh, obviously still poking around even though he's committed to Virginia and then uh, the big one uh, that I was tr- you know and a lot of teams are trying to get is Walter Rouse the uh, 6 six 318. Uh, Stanford grad grad uh, transfer. He is a tackle, um, uh, all American academically, and uh, you know, thirty nine game starter for Stan- Stanford at left tackle over four years. He's down to Iowa, Nebraska, Oklahoma. It sounds like maybe Auburn. Um, so you can see Iowa is making a push to replace Caden Proctor. <laughs> Um, if it, I, think, I mean, obviously, Rouse would be the big, the big fish there. If they could get somebody like that, that would, I mean, help just so immensely uh, to have somebody like that. I mean, he has to see the need for, you know, what's going on at Iowa City and the need for playing time. I'm not saying he, you know, should come here, but uh, man, a huge opportunity. I mean, uh, to step in and be a tackle for the Hawks. Yeah, and I mean the allure of what. Iowa can bring to the table as far as what they've put into the NFL with offensive linemen also has to be a huge draw to him as well. I talked about this in my postgame mailbag. We talked about this in our postgame podcast after the bowl game that next year feels like a all in effort to win the Big Ten West and go back to the Big Ten championship in the last year of divisions. Walter Rouse is better suited for that for for that one year run than somebody like uh, a Kana Proctor. And I know that the Kana Proctor loss was huge and I know that he has this, you know, huge ceiling, but today, January 6, 2023, Walter Rouse is better than Kana Proctor. And if they were able to bring him into the fold, plug him in, starter, four year starter, all conference performer at the Power 5, um, that would be a huge, huge get. And so would Parker. I mean, somebody who's committed to a Power 5 program in his own right. That's the type of player that Iowa should have been targeting on the offensive line in the portal, somebody that can come in. It is a cut above what they have at tackle. And, um, you know, if they can get one or maybe even, you know, both of those guys, you feel much better about where the offensive line is at, you know, maybe compared to, to where they ended the season. All right, last thing, Kennington on football. And we will, yeah, we got all next week to talk about this stuff. We're going to, you know, it's, it's going to be ongoing. With eight months until the season, um, people asking me, you know, when's stuff going to happen at offensive coordinator? When is Ferentz going to talk? Uh, right now, obviously, as you can see, this is a major time of transition where they're, they're figuring out pieces uh, in the program. I think, you know, it would be wise to uh, see if the Patriots make the NFL playoffs. <laughs> Um, you know, then you can maybe get a better idea on the timetable for Brian Ferentz, potentially just another, um, you know, something to watch there. And, uh, so we don't know you know, right now it's like, we wait, we need, we just kind of have to be patient. Uh, Kirk Ferentz, you know, to his credit, he has a plan in his mind. He's always thinking a couple months ahead, maybe years ahead. Sometimes in this case, uh, I feel very strongly there's going to be a change at offensive coordinator. We will see when that comes, if for sure that it comes, how it comes. We don't know those details just yet. You're just going to have to be patient with the rest, like the rest of us. Obviously, Iowa is in recruiting mode right now, which is the most important thing. 
than figuring out every single coaching staff point. And uh, again, if there's, you know, if John Budmeyer is part of this uh, equation going forward, you know, you know, he's probably, you know, working on, I don't know, he's working on a new offense or whatever. Um, you know, there's, there's stuff you can speculate about and, and, but we just have to wait and see. Uh, we don't know that. We don't know that for sure. But Kennington, just kind of what do you make of, uh, I, I feel like it's an exciting vibe, to, honestly, right now. Right now, I, th- I think the win in the bowl game, we talked about, you know, meaningless bowl game, whatever. I, I feel like there's been a real roll of momentum here with that bowl game win. Um, you know, it, it might not be seen on the outside, like outside the nation like that, but I feel like there's a little bit of positivity surrounding this hockey team. Oh, my gosh, that defense is so good. Let's just see, you know, we've been saying this for two years now, but let's just see if they can get an average to, to above average offense. Um, I think you've seen positivity here. I'll give you the final word on football. Yeah, I mean, I think that the the move uh, on offensive coordinator is like the last um, stone and like, you know, the infinity gauntlet or, or whatever. I'm making a Marvel reference here. Look at what Iowa has been doing this offseason that falls in line with what Kirk said a year ago. A year ago, he said that, you know, we're betting on us in terms of quarterback, coaching staff, you know, as a system. At this time last year, NIL was not on the forefront of his mind. And here we sit one year later, and Iowa went out and got a new quarterback in the transfer portal the first chance that they got. They've been extremely active in the chance for quarterly recruiting. They seem very willing to play ball with NIL, and they seem very committed on that front. Now the last thing is changes on the coaching staff. So, you know, for the people that said that, you know, France was so change adverse and these changes would never come and he would never do this and never do that, the circumstances around the program have led itself to where he's had to make these moves. He's been very uh, aggressive with that. Will a change come? I believe that it will, like you said. Who exactly is going to be the new offensive coordinator? I think, you know, you could go in a lot of different directions. And if John Budmeyer ends up being that guy, then there really is no rush to move on that because he's already in-house. So I would just, you know, I guess it would be a cold take to say by the end of the month we'll know exactly what's what's going on. But, you know, just give it a, a little bit more time. Let's see where Iowa continues to do um, on the transfer portal market. I think that is enough of a storyline to kind of hold everybody over until we know what's going on with the coaching staff. But I guess my big picture thought here is this is the off season that I envision Iowa having and knew that changes weren't going to be there. The coaching staff is after the bowl game has only been five days. So give them, you know, a little bit more time on that front. In the meantime, you know, just, you know, focus your energy and, uh, you know, kind of catch the coaching staff on the back for playing hardball at NIL as much as they, they, they can and being aggressive in the chance reporter to try to retool the roster and really go for it next year. Yeah, man. Uh, good stuff today. Thanks for hopping on and doing this on no sleep. This job sometimes can be thankless. And hey, even if you book a flight accidentally a day early, you, you just go and now you get a time to uh, maybe a time to rest and recover once you get to Piscataway. But uh, thanks, Kennington Smith, Chad Leistico, Des Moines Register. It was a little bit of a longer podcast than we usually do, but there was a lot to unpack. We haven't seen each other. Uh, in the new year until today. So thanks, my man, and uh, safe travels. And uh, good luck to Georgia on Monday. And uh, enjoy the uh, Rutgers game out there. I'm sure Hawkeye fans would love for you to bring them back a win. So see what you can do about that, man. Right. I think I'm the only mem- I think I'm the only media member going to this game. So From Iowa, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's all on me. And uh, <laughs> it's all on me. <laughs> Yeah, and um, you know, you I'll and say, Gary Dolphin. Yeah, right, exactly. And I'll say, and I'll say this, um, you know, it is the the sixth. It's your birthday tomorrow, yep. um, so happy early birthday to you. You are uh, Thanks, an amazing buddy. part. You're an, you're an amazing partner. I say this all the time. I don't know if I would be out here still, or if I would have my sanity if you were not my partner. <laughs> so um, many thanks to you on that. My birthday is on the tenth. Georgia plays on the ninth. So hopefully, I can get a. A, a nice birthday present going into to that day. But, um, you know, if I don't talk to you before uh, tomorrow, happy birthday to you. And um, everybody listening to this, go with Chad a, a happy birthday. He deserves to have some fun this weekend. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Kennington. We will sign off with that. Appreciate your safe travels. And Hawk fans, we will talk to you soon. Take care.